morning to you. We're so glad that you're here. Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. It's a blessing to have you here this morning. Trust you were here for Sunday school. If you're looking for a small group to plug into and to get to know people on a different level and a more intimate level to get to know a smaller group of people, that's a great place to start is Sunday school. There's three adult classes. There's one here in the auditorium. There's one in the fellowship hall. And then there's one at the top of the stairs upstairs for adult classes. Then, of course, there's plenty of classes for the kids. So we encourage you to come. Um, you can be at work at 8 or 9 on Monday, but you can't be at Sunday school by 10. So we encourage you to be there. It's a blessing and an opportunity that we make available, and we're thankful for all those that are faithfully teaching and serving in those areas for Sunday school. Thanks for what you're doing. If you're a guest with us, we're grateful that you're here. God brings people here that he wants to hear the message this morning, to sing the songs that are ready, and to minister with the saints. And so we're thankful that you're a guest with us this morning. Hope you got a good welcome from the Welcome Center out front. And if you just take a moment and fill out the card in that welcome packet and return it to the Welcome Center, we sure would appreciate that very much. We have the ladies' evening coming up this Friday here at church, 7 o'clock, homemade food, a Bible lesson, good fellowship, lots of conversation. I encourage you men and boys to get your mom out of the house and take care of things so she can be here at 7 o'clock. We have the front doors locked since it's in the evening, so come in the back door by the, so you can go directly into the fellowship hall. There's flyers that are going around for that. They've been going around in Sunday school, other places. It's a time to refresh or to remember what God has done. So I encourage you ladies to be here at 7 this Friday evening. Then for Master Club, our ministry to kids on Wednesday nights, we have our pine car race coming up. This Saturday is the work day. We know that not everybody has the ability to cut those blocks into cars and sand them and so on. So we have all that provided here. So this Saturday, 10 in the morning to noon, We'll have it all set up so you can bring the block of wood. You need to purchase it from Valerie, our club secretary, on Wednesday night. Or you can come Saturday morning and get a car. They're $5 for the kit. It has all the pieces in the kit. And we will help you cut it out. We'll help you sand it. And we'll help you paint it. If you want to do anything beyond that, you have a week to finish it after that. Because the following Saturday, a week from this Saturday, is the race date. We have a big shiny metal track that we pull out. It's pretty loud back there. Lots of excitement. Lots of cheering and we start racing the cars. There's prizes given out for best paint job and sleekest design. It's just a really fun day. The next two Saturdays, 10 to 12 here at Lighthouse. So if you're a master clubber, we have the uh, alumni category and parents category. You can also purchase a car and race a car. So we'd encourage you to be a part of that as well. We do have the Lord's Table two weeks from tonight so that you can be aware of that and prepare accordingly. We're going to start off the service with a word of prayer now as we begin. Lord, we thank you that you are worthy of all power and praise and glory and honor. We come to you with grateful hearts for your goodness and your mercy that have followed us this week. Thank you that because you are our shepherd, we shall not want. You are the door. You are the access that we need to God. Thank you, Jesus, for being our mediator between God and men. Thank you, Lord, for being our light. We do not have to walk around in darkness. Thank you that the word of God can lighten our path. The Holy Spirit can illuminate it to us, and that we can walk as children of light. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our shepherd. Thank you that we can know your voice and we can follow you and we can know that we are a child of God. Thank you for the church. Thank you for bringing us together this morning that we can sing praise to you. We do so gratefully. We do so sincerely from the heart. We pray that the music would affect us in a way that would draw us closer to you. I pray that you would help us with the preaching to, to give attention to what the Holy Spirit is teaching us and encouraging us and rebuking us and condemning us and encouraging us along life's way. I pray that you would use the word of God and the preacher and the word of God this morning to be a blessing to us and that we would process those things that you bring across our path, that, that you'd be gracious unto us to raise us up, to leave here and to walk in a manner worthy of you unto all pleasing, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. We want to approve things that are excellent in this world around us where there's so much chaos, there's so much hurriness and scurriness, Lord, help us to be at peace with you. Help us have a quietness in our soul that is a balm and a help to other people along, life, along life's way. Thank you for the gospel that we can give to coworkers, to friends, to neighbors. Thank you for the outreach that we did yesterday with the church in Lavernia. I pray that everyone that got those packets would read the word of God and that you'd use the Holy Spirit to illuminate it to them, that they would be drawn closer to you, that they would be willing to consider going to a good Bible-believing church and be a pillar in that body to be able to help do the work of the ministry. Thank you for this morning. We look forward to singing praise to you and being fed by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 560 is gonna be our first song. Let's stand together. This is Thinking About Heaven. 
One day when we get over to the glory land, let's all smile and sing this to the Lord. 560. I've a home prepared where the saints abide just over in thy glory land. And I long to be by my Savior's side just over in thy glory land. Just over in thy glory land, now join the happy angel band just over in thy glory just over in thy glory land there with the mighty hosts I'll stand just over in thy glory land I am on my way to those mansions bright just over in thy glory land there to sing God's praise and his glory share just over in thy glory Just over in that glory land, just over in that glory land, there with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in that glory land. What a joyful thought that my Lord I'll see, just over in that glory land, and with him. Just over in that glory land, just over in that glory land, are with the mighty host I'll stand, just over in that glory land. With the blood washed strong, I will shout and sing, just over in that glory land, that was started smiling 571 that's our next one what a day it's going to be when we get to heaven and we see jesus we'll sing and shout the victory you ready sing the wondrous love of jesus sing his mercy and his grace in the mansions one another and we'll come back and join for the last verse.
together on the last. Onward to the prize before us. Soon his beauty will be home. Soon the pearly gates will open. We shall turn the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day. a screen song that we're going to do now so as we get the lights for the congregation this is another great song about heaven we just can't fit them all in our songbook so let's sing about this what a day it's going to be when we get to heaven and we see jesus let's sing it out to him seated. What a day that is going to be. Indeed, we have victory in the Lord Jesus, and we're thankful for that. Victory now and victory then. Brother Davis, would you come? We're going to give our tithes and offerings at this time, and you can pray for this part of our service. We are so thankful for your faithful giving to the Lord here at Lighthouse. Lord, I thank you for the time we can come together, Lord. Lord, please use this time, Lord, to, to strengthen our, not only ourselves, Lord, Lord, but our fellowship, Lord. Lord, also, Lord, that I could ask, Lord, for this offering, Lord. Lord, may it be used to further your kingdom, Lord. Lord, please bless the gift and the giver, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray. Amen.
112 will be our next song. Will you stand with us? In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bathes the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. He is our gentle shepherd. 112. In shady green pastures, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. Where the water's cool flow bends the weary one's feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all blood some through great sorrow but god gives a song in the night season and all the day long sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright god leads his dear children along sometimes in the valley in darkest of night god leads Dear children of all, some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood, some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. Though sorrows be and Satan opposed, God leads his dear children along. Through grace we can conquer, defeat all our foes, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some Fifteen will be our final song. Children's Church is going to begin. If you're headed there, now's the time to go. 115, there is a rest in every woe. There is a refuge from the foe. It's in his name, the name of Jesus. 115. There is a rest in every woe. There is a refuge from the foe. There is a peace the world can in his name. There is a glow in darkest night, a dawn of hope, a guiding light. There is a help in helpless plight. It's in his name. It's in his name. His name is Thank you for singing to the Lord this morning. We have our scripture memory, reading, and prayer time, so please remain standing. All right, well, good morning. We come to this time where we're going to be doing our scripture memory, and we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10, and we'll read it together twice through, and then on the third time, we'll uh, try to read it from memory. And then I'll ask you to hold your place in 1 Timothy chapter 4, because that's where we're going to be for scripture reading this morning. But in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 10, let's read it together. 
For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. 1 Timothy 4, 10. All right. Let's go ahead and read that together again. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. 1 Timothy 4.10. All right, and if we're brave enough, we can look up and say this from memory. And let's go ahead and begin. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. 1 Timothy 4.10. All righty. And uh, again, we're going to be in 1 Timothy chapter 4 for our scripture reading this morning, but we're going to begin in verse number 6. And I'll go ahead and read that out loud, and you can follow along silently. 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 6, the Word of God says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying, and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you, Father, for your presence here this morning. And Lord, we thank you for this building you've given us to meet in this morning, Father, where we can come in and, and, and sit in relative comfort, Lord, to, to hear from you. And Father, we thank you for the music we've had this morning, Father. May it glorify thy name. And Lord, we just pray now that, that Father, our hearts would be opened and our minds would be uh, trained on, on listening to your word, Father. And, and I pray, God, that you'd be with our pastor this morning, Father, as, as he opens the word of God and preach what you put on his heart to preach this morning, Father. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit will have free reign in this service. And Lord, if there be any here this morning that doesn't know you as their Savior, Father, I pray, God, that today they might hear a clear presentation of the gospel, Father, and, and respond to the tugs of the Holy Spirit, Father, to call upon your name for salvation. And Lord, I just pray now that you would be glorified in everything that's said and done the remainder of this service, and in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. And you may be seated. It is good to be with you in the Lord's house today, this morning. If you're happy to be here, say amen. Amen. I'm having a few technical difficulties, so give me just a second, if you would, please. Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, praise the Lord. It is good to be with you this morning. And, uh, Grateful to hear all of the, the, the singing and the praises and the, pray, and the praying that we do. And uh, this is the time of the service, of course, when we come to the Word of God and we ask God to move and work in our, in our midst and help us to understand Him better uh, by understanding the Word of God and learning how to apply it to our lives. And I pray that uh, this portion of our time together uh, would be uh, encouraging to you, helpful to you. Surrender to it. Allow God to use it for your life and for his honor and for his glory. Many years ago, I took a job with United Airlines, and I was assigned to the section that maintains what is popularly called the black box. After a crash, after an airplane crash, these are the boxes that investigators are looking for. You often hear that on the news. They're, they're looking for the black box. And there are two kinds of black boxes. There are the voice recorder and there's the flight recorder. Interestingly enough, they're not black. Uh, they want to find them, so they actually paint them a, a bright orange and usually put uh, luminescent tape on them as well so that they can be found. They want to easily be able to find the black boxes because of the recordings that they have of the flight and what was happening at the time just before the crash, what was happening with the instruments, what was happening in the cockpit, the things that were being said. And so I was assigned to that particular area where rep repairs and maintenance was affected on those particular boxes. One of the technicians that I met on my first day at work at United Airlines was a guy by the name of Stacy Ringlespa. I've never forgotten Stacy. Stacy had a bad case of OCD, if you know what I mean. And so his workbench always looked immaculate especially at the end of the shift, because as far as Stacy was concerned, everything had a place 
And those things had to be in that place before he could go home. And so he had to make sure it was, everything was right and everything was spick and span, so to speak, at his desk before he would even leave uh, work that day. Well, because of his peculiarity, if you will, uh, sometimes the guys would, you know how guys are. And so before he would get into work in the morning, somebody would move something or take something or, or do something, you know, small on his desk. And Stacy, because of his OCD, he would always spot it right away. And so they'd move something around, and then we'd wait for Stacy to come in, and we knew he was going to see it, and he'd walk up to his desk. He had the same routine, walk up real fast, and then he'd stop at his desk, and he'd look at it, and then and if something was moved or something was gone, this is what Stacy would do. Come on, guys. Mm. You know, and he'd do these, <laughs> he would gesture that way. It's interesting thing, interesting character Stacy was, but he would get over it. But my question in all of that, and the reason why that comes up is, is why is it that we are like that? I mean, as people, as human beings, so there's something in human nature, and I'm speaking in a general sense, I'm not, uh, 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 you know, saying we're all like this, but generally speaking, there's something in human nature where humans find the need to persecute other people that are not like them. I don't know why that is, but it happens all the time. Christians as a group of people are called to be different. The Bible even calls us a peculiar people, saying that Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works." Consequently, if you think about that, if God has redeemed us and brought us into the family of God in order for us to be a peculiar people, if we're not peculiar, then we're not doing this Christian thing right. You with me? We're certainly not doing Bible Christianity right or biblical Christianity if we're not a peculiar people. However, peculiar people are the kind of people who get picked on right? They're the kind of people that stand out and the kind of people that, that pick, uh, get picked on. And sure enough, Paul touches on this truth in, in this letter that he is, has written to Timothy. Like Paul, Timothy was a fellow, fellow minister or pastor, which is alluded to in verse number six. Look there again, if you would please, in verse number six of chapter four here in First Timothy. The Bible says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, a good pastor, a good lover of mankind. You, uh, uh, so put them into remembrance of these things, and thou shalt do well, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So he as the pastor, he is the minister, is to teach them the word of God and bring them up in these things. And so when Paul says in verse number 10 that we both labor and suffer reproach, he is primarily speaking to Timothy about labor, about the labor and sufferings of pastors. So in verse number 6, again, he mentions this idea that, that to, to minister to people, you have to nourish them up in the words of faith and in good doctrine, but refuse profane and, and old wives' fables. Don't bring anybody up in that kind of nonsense. Refuse those things. Bodily exercise, he talks about profiting little. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. But in verse number 10, when he says this, for therefore we, speaking primarily again to Timothy, because this letter is to Timothy, so he and Timothy as ministers, therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. And so that's the primary audience, if you will, speaking about their labor and the reproach that they suffer. But we also know that Paul is not restricting this truth to just pastors. And just ministers, because he does not say to Timothy that we labor and suffer reproach because of our pastor or because of our ministry or because of the work that we do among the people. He doesn't say that. Rather, he says that we labor and suffer reproach because of our trust in the living God. So look at it again in verse number 10. For therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust 
in the living God. That means that this truth applies equally to all those who trust in the living God, including anyone that is here today. If you're here today and you trust in the living God, and I pray, God, that is your testimony. If you don't have that testimony, please don't leave here today until you get that settled. We want to help you with that. God loves you. He wants you to know that he loves you. He sent his son to die for you so that you can come into the family of God, and we'd love to be able to show you what that means. But if you are here today and you've trusted in the living God, then Paul essentially is speaking to you as well. Primarily, again, he is directing his thoughts toward Timothy, but they go broadly out to all that are here today that have trusted in the living God. So if that's you, I want you to see this morning that Paul is speaking to you and saying that if you, as an individual here today at Lighthouse Baptist Church, if you labor, then you will suffer reproach. So look at it again. Therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach. If we labor, we will suffer reproach. Why? Because we trust in the living God. Turn over to 2 Timothy real quick. 2 Timothy chapter number 3. And here in 2 Timothy, Paul speaks specifically about his sufferings. 2 Timothy chapter 3, look at verse number 11. The Bible says, Persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me in in Antioch, in Iconium, in Lystra, that persecutions, uh, what what persecutions I endured, uh, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. So these persecutions and afflictions, the things that he has gone through, the things that he has had to endure. But then he says that he's not a special case. He essentially says that this is true, really, again, about all those who trust in the living God. So look at verse number 12, if you would, please. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall, not maybe, but shall suffer persecution. If you are a peculiar person, you're going to be picked out of the crowd. And those that are peculiar are set themselves up, if you will, for that kind of persecution because something in human nature is drawn to that, drawn to persecuting those that are different. And so Paul says, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to be peculiar, you're going to be different, and you shall suffer persecution. And so as we have said, as peculiar people, we ought to expect this. Christians suffer reproach from men because, again, of our trust in the living God. People will say to us that we believe in fairy tales. They will say to us that we believe God because God is a kind of intellectual crutch because there are things that can't be explained in the universe, and so we have a kind of God of the gaps belief that God is just there to fill in the gaps of the things that science cannot yet explain. They call us bigots. They call us fanatics. They call us radical fundamentalists. They call us Islamophobes, homophobes, transphobes, racists, Bible-thumping theocrats. And it goes on and on and on, the things that they say against Christians. The world hates Christ, and therefore it hates those that love him. But not only do we suffer reproach at the hands of men... Christians also suffer in the spiritual realm. We suffer reproaches from Satan and his demons, from Satan and his crowd. They are spiritual beings, and because we are part spirit, they, Satan and his crowd can, uh, can infiltrate, if you will, our kind of thoughts, our, our, our thinking, and the way, the way that we act through our spirit. And, to, and so they communicate to us through our spirit. Now, the favorite weapon of Satan and his crowd is our inconsistency as Christians. In other words, our failure to live as we are expected to live. Our, 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 our experience in failing God and, uh, and failing the word of God and not uh, d- keeping what God has commanded us to keep over and over again. And so the inconsistencies of our life. And so Satan and his crowd picks on those things, the wrong kind of thoughts that we have. 
And so they just kind of bring out those thoughts that we have and remind us that we don't think the uh, godly thoughts that we ought to think. If we do the wrong thing, if we uh, do some kind of unkind action, then uh, Satan and his demons are right there to remind us of how unchristian we have been and to keep us down and to bring us down because of those things and, and the anger that we might experience or the lust that we might experience or the pride that we might experience. All of these things are, are their favorite weapon to bring against an inconsistent Christian. And so the constant reproaches that we suffer in this life from both men and from the spiritual realm are really enough to wear us down. And if you've been a Christian for any period of time, you know what that's like to be worn down over and over again. And all these things seem to be against me. Kind of like what Jacob said, that all these things are against me. And it seems like uh, the world is against me, that Satan and his demons are against me. And and it's enough to grow weary in the battle. And we do often grow weary. The Bible says, but ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Don't grow weary. Why do you think that God admonishes us not to be weary because we have a propensity to be weary, to grow weary in the race because of these things that are stacked against us. And so we are warned against being weary because it is all too easy to fall into that trap, if you will. So how are we supposed to not be weary? How is that? How do we get to that place where we're not weary? And the Bible answer is this. By overcoming. And so the Bible says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. So the sufferings that Paul is bringing uh, to, to Timothy's attention in 1 Timothy, the sufferings that we endure that he brings to Timothy's uh, attention again in 2 Timothy, the things that, that, that happen in life that bring us down. We are to overcome those things, the Bible says, those evil things, by overcoming them with good, the Bible says. And overcoming means that, that, again, the sufferings of this life, we're not supposed to be weighed down by them. We're not supposed to be underneath them. We're supposed to be over them. We're supposed to have the victory over them, the Bible says. And that's the idea, to get out from underneath those things. So how, then, do we overcome our sufferings? How do we overcome the reproaches that we experience in this life? Well, number one, we do it with faith. With faith. Turn with me, if you would, please, to 1 John chapter 5. Toward the back of your Bible, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. If you get to Revelation, put on the brakes and turn left. First John chapter number five. So again, Paul says that if we are going to live godly for, for Christ Jesus, if we trust in the living God and we labor for him, then we are going to be peculiar. And because we are peculiar, we are going to suffer persecutions. How do we overcome those things? Well, we do it, number one, by faith. Look, if you would, please, at verse number four. The Bible says, whatsoever is born of God. So if you're born again, if you're born into the family of God, and by the way, as I mentioned earlier, if you've not trusted in the living God, if you don't know him as your Savior, then this isn't speaking particularly to you. You need to get that settled. But if you're here today and you're trusting in the living God, the Bible says that you're born again. And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Do you see that? Just say amen. And so you see that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our, what's that last word, church? Faith. So whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, our faith. Now, there are a number of Bible truths that declare the fact that we can and should be overcomers in this life because of our new relationship with God, because we are born in the Lord Jesus Christ and placed in him. For instance, Jesus himself said this. He said, in this world, ye shall have tribulation. Sounds an awful lot like what Paul is saying. 
If you're going to live godly for Christ Jesus, if you're going to labor for him because you've trusted in him, then you are going to suffer persecutions. Jesus said, in this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And because we are in him, he is our overcomer, we can overcome with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Not on my own, not by myself, but because I am in Christ, because I'm a new creature, the Bible says, I can do all things. You know what we need more of? We need more of an I can kind of Christianity. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And so the Bible says, but again, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the victory again is through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul asks this very, very important question. He says, what then shall we say to these things? Now, in the context of Romans chapter eight, when he says that, he's talking about, again, the idea of overcoming these things, these things that we suffer in this life, the sufferings of this life. And he's saying, what shall we say to these things? What should we say to these things that bring us down? What should we say to the sufferings that we experience in this life? What should we say to the persecutions and the reproaches that we bear in this life? What should we say to these things? Paul's answer is this. If God be for us, go ahead, say it. Who can be against us? Wow. Wow. I mean, that, that's passage after passage after passage that, that says, if you are in Christ, if you know the Lord, if you're trusting in the living God, then you ought to live an overcoming life. You can indeed live an overcoming uh, a coming life. In that same passage in Romans chapter 8, Paul goes on to say, nay, in all these things, in all these sufferings, in all the issues of this life and of this world, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him, through the Lord Jesus jesus christ that loved us you with me now either all of those things are true or they're not now look again with all of that in mind look again at first john chapter five look again at verse number four for whatsoever is born of god overcometh the world and this is the victory this is how you do it this is how you gain the victory this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith the bible is very clear we have all the tools that we need for overcoming it's all there and it's always there it never goes away the grace of god is always there for you to be an overcomer for you to live as an overcomer it doesn't go away the grace is always available but in the end it comes down to our faith The tools are always there. The tool shed is always open. The grace is always available, but in the end, it comes down to our faith. You see, listen to me carefully. If you're going to overcome the persecutions, the sufferings, the the reproaches that you bear in this life, if you're going to overcome all these things, it's going to start with your faith. In other words, here it is, put simply. You must believe that you can overcome. And I don't say that lightly because I know that can be a challenge. But you must believe that you can overcome. Do you believe that you can overcome? It starts there because that's how you grab hold of the faith or grab hold of the grace that enables you to overcome is by your faith. And if you do not believe all these passages that we've read from the Word of God about the ability you have to overcome, if you don't believe them, then you won't live an overcoming life. You got it? That's where it starts. It's with our faith. How am I going to overcome these persecutions, Pastor? 
How am I going to overcome all these things that, that are there constantly? They never go away. There's always some kind of persecution. There's always some kind of uh, bringing me down. There's always something holding me back. How am I going to overcome these things? It starts with your faith. Do you believe that you believe that you believe? Do you know that you know that you know that you can overcome? That's where it starts. Until you believe that, you will not overcome. Secondly, the question is then, if we believe that we can overcome, then the question is, how do we apply our faith to overcoming? How do we do that? Okay, pastor, I see the scriptures. I understand that. I want to believe. And, and so as best I know how, I, I believe that I can live an overcoming life. Okay, so how do I apply that to my life so that I can overcome? Well, we do it secondly by casting. By casting. Turn with me, if you would, please, to 1 Peter. Just a few pages back to the left in your Bible. 1 Peter chapter number 5. Everybody there? Are these verses are important. If you're, if you're really going to kind of understand where it is that we're going, you need to get these verses down and understand them. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. Your faith is... The overcoming, the victory is in our faith, the Bible says. And then how do I apply that faith to my life to make it real in my life? Well, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7 says this, Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Casting all your care upon him. If you've been a Christian for any time, any amount of time, you are likely familiar with this particular verse. You may not have known where it is in the Bible, but now you do. Amen. So you might not have known that it's right here, but you probably knew it was in the Bible somewhere. But my question for you is this. If you know about it and you know that it's in the Bible, my question is this. Have you ever attempted to do what the verse says? Have you ever attempted to cast your cares upon him knowing that he careth for you? Have you ever attempted to do that? And if you have, have you ever failed? Have you, have you ever wondered, Lord, I know what it says, but I guess I don't know how to do it. How do I do it? How does it work? If you've wondered that, then you're not alone. And it does not mean that you're doubting God's word. I am sure that you believe that this verse is true. You just don't know how to apply it. So think with me, if you would, please. The verse itself is easy enough to understand. The idea is that we are to take the cares that hold us back and hold us down, you know, the things that have happened in our life, all these sufferings that have come upon us, and now they're cares, now they're burdens, and they're weighing us down. We're to take all of that nonsense, all of that garbage in our life, that gunk, so to speak, we're to take it and we're to transfer it to the Lord, right? The verse says, casting your care upon him taking it off of you and casting upon him, for he careth for you. That's the idea. Now, the difficulty in this verse is with, with one word. It's the word cast or casting. How do we cast our cares on the Lord? Now, the word in the Greek and in the English mean the same thing. There's a shock. <laughs> they both mean to throw. You with me? To cast means to throw. So take a simple illustration. I've got here a paper ball. All right? Now I'm going to throw this paper ball. You ready? I threw it so fast you didn't even see it go, huh? Now, did I throw it? No, I didn't. Well, let me try again. Did I throw it then? Look, in both cases, I did exactly the same thing with one little detail. The second time, I let it go. You see, 
I can do all the right things and doing, going through all of the motions and everything's right, but if I don't let it go, I'm not really casting. I'm not really throwing. And it's no different with your cares. You may go through all the right motions. You may do all the right things. You may go to the Lord in prayer. You may come to God in, in, in Scripture. You may go seek counsel. There are a number of things that you can do that are good and right, going through the motions, because I want to cast it. But in the end, if you don't let it go, you haven't cast it. Do you understand? You've got to actually give it to the Lord. You've got to actually let it go. Now, I know some of your minds are going to Disney. Please don't do that. In all seriousness, it needs to be let go. Amen. You've got to give it to the Lord. Turn with me to another passage. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Everybody there? Look at verse 13. Brethren. Everybody there? No. Do, 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 do. Uh, verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, this one thing I understand, this one thing I get, I must forget those things which are behind that I might reach forth to those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You cannot and you will not press forward, reaching forth to that which is before so long as you're holding on to that which is behind. What's that mean? <laughs> you got to let it go. Those things that are burdening you, burdening you, those things that are bearing down upon you, you can't change any of it by being angry about it. You can't change any of it by, con by worrying over it. You can't change any of it by bringing it up over and over and over and over in your mind. It's behind you. There's nothing you can do about it. If you're going to move forward for Christ, then you're going to have to let it go. You're going to have to actually, listen carefully, you're going to have to actually cast it on the Lord. Give it to Him, knowing that He cares for you. To reach forth is to overcome. And in order to reach forth, your hand has to be empty. Remember also... We said that the favorite weapon of Satan and his demons is our failures. Listen, if you're already struggling with your failures, if you're already reluctant to let them go, guess who's going to help you keep them? You with me? By bringing it up over and over and over and over again. And it'll never get let go, if that's good English. You've got to actually let it go. To hold on to our cares is giving far too much ground in our lives to the enemy. And when we give ground to the enemy, we'll never overcome. Faith is our victory. We must believe that we can overcome. And we apply the faith of overcoming in the first place to casting. Casting all those cares that are bringing you down. Casting all those cares that are keeping you from overcoming. Casting it all on the Lord. Giving it to God. Now, once we've applied our faith to casting, then we need to apply our faith by, thirdly, doing good. Doing good. Turn with me to Romans, if you would, please. Romans chapter number 12. Now, this is the verse that, that we used at the beginning of the message that told us at the beginning of our study that we are supposed to be overcomers. That's how we uh, get around this idea of being weary. How we overcome, if you will, being weary is by overcoming being weary. And this is the passage that we used 
that we looked at, if you will, about overcoming. So Romans chapter 12 and verse number 21, the Bible says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, as we have already seen, the victory to overcome is our faith. We must believe that we can overcome. And then we have to take all the cares that have been holding us back and keeping us from overcoming and cast them on the Lord. Now, once we have freed ourselves from the shackle of our cares and the shackle of the things in our past, then we are free to move forward, as Paul said, and live as overcomers. Now, according to Paul in Romans 12, we live as overcomers when we overcome evil with what, church? Good. We live as overcomers when we overcome evil with good. So how do we do that? Well, turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter number 5. And look at verse number 25 once you get there. Ephesians 5 and verse number 25. And once you get to chapter 5, turn back to chapter 4. In verse number 25, chapter 4 and verse number 25, the Bible says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Put away lying and put on truth, so to speak. For we are members of one another. Be uh, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole... Stop doing it. Steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that, that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Now listen, the idea of this passage is replacement. That's the idea of this passage. To identify the bad habits in our life, the things that we do that are evil, and to replace those bad things, with good things. To replace them, to do the good thing in the place of the bad thing that we were doing. Now with that in mind, look at verse number 31. Let these other bad things, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, let all of these things be put away from you with all malice. Put them away from you. And then put something in its place. Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And so again, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and lying and stealing and all the things that the passage mentions, all these things that we can identify as evil, and by the way, we can identify in our lives as well, those things that you identify with, Put them away once you've identified them and then replace them with the good things that you can do in their place. Once again, be kind, be tenderhearted, be forgiving. Put good things in their place. Now listen carefully. Anyone can do good things for a moment or in a a moment or at a time. But to really truly replace evil with doing good in your life you're going to have to go to work on your heart. Anyone can do it right now or for a moment. But if you're going to replace evil in your life with doing good, then you're going to have to work on your heart. The Bible says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That's what comes out of the heart. But a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. So in your heart is either the, those evil things or you're going to replace those evil things with good things so that you will do good things instead of the evil things. You've got to go to work on your heart. The idea is that good thoughts lead to good deeds. Pretty simple, but not so easy to do. You'll spend the, li- you'll spend the rest of your life attempting to take the evil out of your heart and put the good in. But start, amen? Work on it now to, do, to replace those evil thoughts with good thoughts so that you might do good deeds. So then if your heart is filled with, with good thoughts, then your life will be filled with those deeds that you can do to overcome evil. Now, none of us is where we would like to be when it comes to doing good. But the best way to get better is to go to work on your heart. Blessed is the man 
that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the seat of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Why? Because he's trying to cleanse his thought life, to meditate on those good things, on the word of God, rather than meditating on those things that you hear in the world, those things that you hear in the counsel of the ungodly. I'm not going to go with them. I would rather delight in the word of God. I'm not going to stand in the way of sinners. I'm not going to sit in the seat of scornful because then I'm going to find that I'm going to hear the things that are going to fill my heart with the wrong kinds of thoughts, but I want to delight in the law of God. Paul understood the value of working on the heart. And so he said this, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, hey, think on these things. Think on these things. Get a hold of your thought life. Why? Because as you think in your heart, so are you. And a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. And when you do that which is good, the Bible says you overcome evil. You overcome evil with good. Amen? Think on these things. Turn with me, if you would, please, back to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Again, when your thoughts are right, then you will do good things. And when you do good things, you overcome evil. And when you overcome evil, then you are living life as an overcomer. Now, Paul here in 1 Timothy, he warns Timothy. And through Timothy, he's really warning all of us who trust in the living God that if you labor, you will suffer reproach. If you want to live godly, if you want to labor for God, then the Bible says you shall suffer persecution. You shall suffer rebukes. These things are going to happen. You're going to suffer reproach. In fact, as we have seen, it comes at us from all sides. It's not just from the people, but also from Satan and his crowd. It comes at us from every angle so that it's easy to grow weary. How do we keep from growing weary? We keep from growing weary by overcoming. We overcome our sufferings first and foremost by faith. Listen to me carefully. Here's perhaps the most important question of the whole study, of the whole message. Do you truly believe that you can overcome? I can overcome. Do all things through Christ. Either that verse is true or it's not. Do you believe that you can overcome? If you can, then you can get on the path to overcoming. Well, what's step two? Well, what is it that's keeping you down? What what is it that is keeping you from overcoming? What is that burden? What is that care? Take it and cast it. Cast it on the Lord. Don't go through the motions. Don't throw it and hold it, because that's not casting. Give it to the Lord. Don't let it keep you any longer. As Paul said, forgetting those things that are behind, I press toward the mark. Then lastly, now that I've dealt with those things that are keeping me down, What am I going to do moving forward? Do good. Do good. How am I going to keep good as the pattern of my life? By working on your heart. By replacing those evil things with good things. Amen? 
you can overcome sufferings. You can. Question is, will you begin your journey? Will you begin a journey of overcoming? That's your decision to make. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you this morning, I thank you, Father, for an opportunity to pray to you and ask you, Father, to move and to work. Lord, in my own heart, my own life, and in the life of everyone that is here today, Lord, I pray that we would all, each and every one of us, be surrendered to you today. And ask you, Lord, is there something that's hindering me? What is it? Is it my faith? Is it my casting? Is it in my doing good things? Search me, Lord. Show me, Father, how to live an overcoming life. To overcome evil with good. Help me, Lord, not to be surprised by the fact that I do suffer. By the fact that these things do come upon me. Lord, help me not to be weary. Thank you for these dear people. Thank you for this opportunity. But Father, there's one last thing that I'd like to bring before your throne. Lord, there might be someone here today who does not know you as their Savior. Lord, there might be someone here today, if you were to say to them, why should I let you into my heaven? Lord, they might not have a Bible answer for that. Lord, there is a Bible answer. You do tell us from your word how we can be saved. And Lord, if there's anyone like that, I, I pray, Father, that they might have the courage to come forward and let us take a man with a man, a woman with a woman, and show them today how they can be saved and how they, too, can get on, to, on that road to overcoming. Lord, it's a journey. It's a lifetime. But I thank you, Father, for walking with us through it. Lord, help us to apply these truths today. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning?